my favorite episodes of the Twilight Zone is called The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street. Scene is set in a town not unlike New Milford, a quote, tree-lined little world of front porch gliders, barbecues, the laughter of children. Suddenly, a shadow passes over Maple Street along with a flash of light. A bizarre power outage affects everything from electric stoves to lawn mowers. A little boy, seen reading a comic book, raises the speculation that aliens could be living among the people disguised as ordinary human beings. Under the pressure of the mysterious power outage, anxieties rise along with paranoia. When one man's car suddenly turns on all by itself, the people turn on him, suspicious that perhaps he might be an alien. Darkness descends, and a shadowy figure emerges from the distance, only to be shot by one of the people of Maple Street, before they realize it was only an innocent man they had sent to scout out other streets. The witch hunt turns on the man with the gun, chasing him towards his house and pelting him with rocks. Suddenly, Lights begin flashing on and off in houses throughout the neighborhood. Lawn mowers and car engines start and stop for no apparent reason. The mob becomes hysterical, hurling accusations, smashing windows, taking up weapons as the situation devolves into an all-out riot. The scene cuts to a nearby hilltop, revealing aliens watching the riot on Maple Street while using a device to manipulate the neighborhood's power. They comment on how simply fiddling with the people's electricity consistently leads them to descend into panic. They discuss their intention to use this strategy to conquer Earth one neighborhood at a time. The episode closes with the ominous voice of Rod Serling, who says, the tools of conquest do not necessarily come with bombs and explosions and fallout. <clears throat> there are weapons that are simply thoughts, attitudes, prejudices, to be found only in the minds of men. For the record, prejudices can kill, and suspicion can destroy, and a thoughtless, frightened search for a scapegoat has a fallout all of its own for the children and the children yet unborn. And the pity of it is that these things cannot be confined to the twilight zone. <laughs> they cannot. It's essentially happening right now, right here in America, even in New Milford. Aliens may not be trying to reduce Maple Street to riots, but the Russians are in fact involved in a massive campaign to turn America against itself. They're not using electricity to do it, they're using the internet. The Russian government-sponsored social media campaign calling itself Blacktivist used both Facebook and Twitter to amplify racial tensions during the United States presidential election this past year. More than 3,000 Russian-bought ads on Facebook show a deep understanding of social divides in American society, with some ads promoting African rights groups, including Black Lives Matter, and others suggesting that these same groups pose a rising political threat. Some ads sought to sow discord among religious groups by showing support for Hillary Clinton among Muslim women. This past election revealed that America is increasingly threatened by internal conflicts. The days of Republicans and Democrats working across party lines are long gone. We can barely get it together to provide for American citizens after environmental disasters. People are paranoid about foreigners of any kind crossing the borders, despite the fact that we're all foreigners when you think about it. Some are more fearful of grassroots organizations like, Black Lives, like the Black Lives Matter movement. On the extreme left, we've even seen a militant political movement, Antifa, hurting its own cause by discrediting the moral high ground of the nonviolent protesters. As evidence of racism and anti-Semitism is becoming louder and prouder, fears and anxieties are leading to rash decisions and irrational behavior. 
I don't know if you saw the recent Washington Post report that a fifth of undergraduate students now say that it's acceptable to use physical force to silence a speaker who makes offensive and hurtful statements. In Connecticut, divisiveness has led to a total incapacity to pass a budget. And this is going to have serious repercussions upon hospitals, schools, and everything that we need in this state. We've seen New Milford fall victim to its own internal strife. I'm not even talking about the racist graffiti we saw at Thompson's. I don't know if you follow any of the New Milford Facebook sites, but the level of vituperation that we're seeing in what should be ordinary conversations about everyday events is absolutely astonishing. I saw a whole conversation ridiculing a homeless man who clearly suffers from some significant issues. At a recent town hall meeting, the mayor was threatened physically by a disgruntled former contractor who said, quote, he deserves to get hit with a baseball bat. Just to give one more example, there was a flyer around town this week posted on Facebook which read as follows, it's a great one, come and witness the wanton misconduct, gross negligence, criminal intent, and the continued conspiratorial actions of the predatorial, out of control, and abusive probate court as they aid in bed, as in embed, not a bet, but embed, and make themselves accomplices to a myriad of lies, fraud, and unlawful conduct. Come watch and listen as they contrive their sinister plots against the innocent. I don't know if you ever met Judge Marty, but it's absolutely <laughs> absurd. I, I mean, it's really ridiculous to hear these words used that way. What we're seeing throughout New Milford, we're also seeing across the country, we're better than this. We need to stop demonizing everyone who disagrees with us. We need to tone down our rhetoric and choose our words more carefully. We need to have our most important conversations in person where it's harder to use hurtful, hateful, and otherwise disrespectful language. Most importantly, we need to shift our thinking from the finger pointing we're seeing all over the place to an appreciation of the humanity of the people with whom we may find ourselves in disagreements. We're less likely to be able to shame or threaten anyone into agreeing with us then we are able to find agreeable compromises that we all can live with. If any real progress is ever going to be made, it takes hard work, empathy, compassion, humility, and the ability to wrap your mind around another person's perspective. Someone recently reminded me of a true story that I'd like to share with you. Back in 1991, Rabbi Michael Weiser was serving the oldest Jewish congregation in Lincoln, Nebraska. Shortly after moving to town, the phone rang one Sunday morning. The man on the other end of the line called Rabbi Weiser a Jew boy. Two days later, he received a thick package of anti-black, anti-Semitic pamphlets, along with an unsigned card that read, the KKK is watching you, scum. According to uh, an article in the New York Times, messages all came from a Larry Trapp, the Grand Dragon of the White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan in Nebraska, who kept loaded weapons, pro-Hitler material, and his Klan robe in his cramped Lincoln apartment. Then 42, Mr. Trapp was nearly blind and used a wheelchair to get around. Both of his legs had been amputated because of diabetes. Rabbi Weiser, who suspected the person threatening him was, in fact, Mr. Trapp, got his telephone number and started leaving messages on his answering machine, like, Larry, there's a lot of love out there. You're not getting any of it. Don't you want some? Or, Larry, why do you love the Nazis so much? They'd have killed you first because you're disabled. He did it once a week. The Rebbitson had told him to say something nice if Mr. Trapp ever responded. When the opportunity arose, Rabbi Weiser said, I heard you're disabled. I thought you might need a ride to the grocery store. Then one night, Rabbi Weiser's phone rang again. It was Mr. Trapp, who said, I want to get out of what I'm doing, and I don't know how. So the rabbi and the Rebbitson drove to Mr. Trapp's apartment that night, 
The three talked for hours in a close friendship forum. The couple's home became a kind of hospice for Mr. Trapp, who eventually moved into one of their bedrooms as his health worsened, and as the rabbi's family became Mr. Trapp's caretakers and confidants. Mr. Trapp eventually renounced the Klan. He apologized to many of those he had threatened, and he actually, believe it or not, converted to Judaism in Rabbi Weiser's synagogue. The former Klan leader died in Rabbi Weiser's Lincoln home in September 1992, less than a year after they met. The rabbi spoke at his funeral. What we know about people who find themselves in extremist <coughs> organizations from the KKK to ISIS is that they are desperate to feel included as a part of a group. I don't know if you saw a fascinating interview on Full Frontal with Samantha B with Christian Picciolini, the former neo-Nazi skinhead who became the co-founder of an organization called Life After Hate. Picciolini's words, he founded Life After Hate to help people disengage from what he created 30 years ago. Under Obama, Life After Hate was the first government-funded group focused on white terrorism. Unfortunately, under our new government, it's been stripped of its $400,000 budget, though crowdsourcing has made up much of the gap. Picciolini describes most of the people he works with as disaffected, lonely, wounded young white guys. According to their website, Life After Hate works to counter the seeds of hate we once planted. Through personal experience and highly unique skill sets, we have developed a sophisticated understanding about what draws individuals to extremist groups and, equally important, why they leave. Compassion is the opposite of judgment, and we understand the roles compassion and empathy play in healing individuals and communities. On Full Frontal, uh, Samantha B sort of toys with how weird it would be to participate in a hug a Nazi program, especially for Jewish people. <laughs> to be clear, I'm not telling everyone to leave the synagogue today and go hug the nearest Nazi. <laughs> the concept, however, is something to think about. These individuals feel disaffected and isolated. They're looking for attention and they desperately desire to be part of a group, part of a movement, part of something meaningful. We can fear them, we can mock them, but what good is ever going to come from any of that? If we don't deal with the root of the problem, we continue to suffer the consequences ourselves. Finger pointing can only get us so far. The fact of the matter is that we live in a society full of people who feel isolated, alienated, and unattached. Interpersonal relationships, have suffered from a devolution in communication from face-to-face -face conversations to phone calls to texts to tweets to trolling. Lost my place. <laughs> we need to work towards developing a more closely knit society and we can start right here in New Milford. We need to increase the opportunities that people have to engage with each other, especially people with different perspectives from different backgrounds and experiences. We need to work to tone down our own rhetoric and de-escalate the conversations in which we find ourselves. When we feel that a communication is becoming inappropriate, we need to call that out. But when our opponents are being respectful and even articulate, we need to show our appreciation for the manner in which they are expressing themselves. We need to talk less about who is on which side. We need to talk more about common ground and what we can accomplish together. When the clergy in this town first met with Mayor Gronbach to establish a hate has no home here group in New Milford, I can't tell you how important it was for everyone involved that the group be nonpartisan, apolitical, all inclusive in the spirit of community building. You know, every time we recite the Shema, we testify that Adonai is our God and Adonai is one. 
We know nothing else about God. It is that God created all people, but Selim Elohim, in the image of God. And if we know just one more thing about God, it's the fact that we're monotheists who believe in one God. How can the vast diversity of humanity, men, women, children, Reformed, conservative, orthodox, Christian, Muslim, atheist, wealthy, poor, educated, illiterate, gay, straight, those who like Neil Diamond and those who do not like Neil Diamond. <laughs> one and all be created in the image of one God. Because what makes God one is what makes unity out of diversity. The only way for Yom Kippur to truly be a day of atonement is for it also to be a day of at one We weren't put on this world to be driven apart by aliens toying with our electricity or Russians distributing fake news through social media. We were put here, one and all, to bring a little more harmony and a little more love into this world. Today's Torah portion teaches us that life and death have been set before you, blessing and curse. Choose life so that you and your children may live by loving, obeying, and staying close to Adonai, your God. How do we love God? By showing love to our neighbor, the stranger, and the needy. How do we obey God? By following those commandments to pursue peace and justice and to provide for those who need it most. How do we stay close to God? By respecting the dignity of all humanity in all its diversity. Our Haftarah portion calls upon us to become repairers of the breach and restorers of the path. The breach may have grown wide, and the path may have become overgrown, but our task remains. Isaiah teaches us that if you remove the chains of oppression, the menacing hand, the malicious word, if you offer your compassion to the hungry and satisfy their suffering, then shall your light shine in the darkness and your night become bright as noon. This 5778, let us focus on our words, the harm that they can cause, and the power that we have to use our words to bring people together as one. Can you hear God's song? Continue with a song from the choir. 